My name is Sarah Season, and I am chair of the Sierra Club Massachusetts chapter plant-based planet team. Our mission is to raise awareness of the effects of animal agriculture on the environment and to encourage people to eat plant-based food. We have um, several events per month where we help people learn how to make healthy plant-based food at home. And I will post those in the chat later. I also would like to say that this session is being recorded. So if you do not wish to be uh, appear on screen, please turn off your video. And now that we are very privileged to have today our first ever speaker. I started the Plant-Based Planet team back in May of 2019. Uh, we've had several events since then, but this is our first ever speaker, Zach Burns of Medical Students for a Sustainable Future. So. Thank you. Away. It's so nice to be here. Uh, let's see if I can share my screen. And also I, I was hoping that maybe if you guys can just shoot in the chat what you do. I want to know what you do all day, whether it's working or volunteering, get a sense of the audience so that we can have an informed discussion here. Okay. Hmm. Okay. Nonprofit, med student, grad student. Okay, awesome. Activist. Love it. All right, so can everyone see my screen? Yes. <laughs> okay. All right. So let's get started. Uh, I think this will be under an hour. We'll have plenty of time for questions. I just want to thank every one of you for being here uh, after however many Zooms that you already had today, maybe 5, 10, 15, who knows. Uh, this is exciting for me to bridge my interest between medicine and the environment, which I've been doing for a while. I'm just so grateful for um, Medical Students for a Sustainable Future, uh, where I was on the board last year, and, um, and for Sarah and your team for making this happen. So. We're gonna call this food environment and zoonotic disease, although we'll incorporate even more subtopics than those. Um, my name is Zach, I'm a DO MPH. I'll graduate in May. So you can sue me then. Um, a DO is like an MD, but we have to explain ourselves. So we, you know, we're licensed to do the same things. Um, we, the tangible difference is we get some osteopathic manipulation in our curriculum. Um, we're also philosophically, we're more holistic. So hopefully that will play out today. Okay, um, this is in your home state of uh, Massachusetts where I grew up in Concord, this is White Pond. So I was born to some very environmentally minded parents and they're the best. And we kept our heat at 52 degrees Fahrenheit in the winter as the default. So if you were cold, you just Put on a jacket. Um, so that spirit of conservation, the concept of finite resources, that was instilled in me pretty early on. Um, what we want to do, and, and just briefly on what I've been up to the last few years. So when I graduated from college, where I did tons of environmental volunteering, you know, I spent a lot of time digging compost and admiring worms for our sustainability. Um, initiatives and uh, organizing rallies and trips to DC. And this was my introduction to, to activism. So after college, I worked with MassPerg, um, public interest research group, and we were running all sorts of green campaigns, public interest campaigns, public health. Uh, I, I saw the extent of corporate influence in our policy, and um, that got me pretty fired up. And I'm sure you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, and then after that, I worked at East Boston Neighborhood Health Center for two years. And I saw some of the manifestations of um, big business um, playing out in people's bodies from what they were you know, advertised to be eating and what they had access to eat. 
um, and the pollution they were exposed to by nature of their, you know, the neighborhoods and right next to the Logan Airport there in East Boston. And um, so, you know, then I went to med school and took a deep dive into plant-based nutrition. And I've been honored to closely assist one of the pioneers in the field, Dr. Michael Clapper, um, so that I've, I've gotten to um, just learned a ton about this and I, it, we'll t get into nutrition toward the end of the hour. Um, today, um, you know, I, the idea here isn't to convince you that factory farming affects the environment where you, you all are starting with um, a great foundation. Uh, what I want to do is fill in any gaps on the medical side and then help connect some dots for everybody on the our food system, the environment, zoonoses, uh, right in the setting of this pandemic. Um, so maybe we'll renew your personal motivation to work on these issues and um, help you communicate the details to your circles. Okay, so I tried to switch up the format here. The, uh, these, many of these slides just pose a question and have a photo. So I want you to ask yourself when I've gone through the slide, um, see if you can't answer that question. And if not, let me know. Although I'm not sure to be honest that, I'm, uh, that the chat is coming through um, the way that I have my screen shared on my iPad. So uh, if you can muster the courage to ask a question out loud, I'd really love it. Um, or we can just wait till the end, whatever you feel comfortable with. So, okay. Um, all right, there's a little noise back there. And now it's good. Okay. So, what is a zoonotic disease? Well, it's an infection, um, virus, bacteria, could be a fungus, or protist, that came from another species besides humans. It didn't originate in us, but um, it, it was able to transfer to humans. Those are the ones, of course, we're most concerned about. And SARS-CoV-2, the virus that's been in the news lately a little bit um, and causes the COVID-19 syndrome, right? It's a zoonotic disease, so we'll talk all about that. It turns out, though, that zoonotic diseases, um, have, they've plagued us for a long time. Um, so the avian flu of 1918 and 1957, uh, those came from poultry and they're highly transmissible. Um, swine flu comes from pigs. Mad cow disease comes from cows uh, who were fed um, other you know, deceased cow body parts and it built that prion disease. Uh, Ebola, HIV, uh, these came from our encroachment on wild habitats and they jumped and thought that they came from, um, from bushmeat. So often mammals in Africa and um, sometimes they originated in bats and then went to that intermediate host as the, the mammal. So um, we have more examples of those with SARS, um, wasn't so long ago and MERS. Okay, so civet, bat, civet cats and, and camels respectively. And zoonoses have occurred throughout history. So the plague, um, which killed a third of Europe in the 1300s was um, from spread through rats and the bacteria was Yersinia pestis, right? What's different today is that these zoonoses are increasing in their, um, the, the number of pathogens that can now transmit to humans um, that rate is increasing. And in the last 30 years, two out of three new diseases have been zoonoses. Okay. All right. Um, this can happen a couple of different ways. So how does this work from livestock? Well, in order to raise the livestock that we're raising um, on that scale, the, they're, you know, the confinement looks like this. And There'll be some photos today. I spared you the really bad ones. Um, I, so, um, but we have to be real about this. Um, this is how those animal foods are getting to our plate. So 80 billion land animals are killed annually. Um, they're mostly chickens. Uh, what happens is the immune systems of these mammals 
well, the pigs or the birds and chickens, um, their immune systems are dampened from that genetic homogeneity um, that comes from selective breeding. They want you know, the most profitable type of animal. And that means that their genetics are really similar. And when you don't have genetic diversity, you have a susceptible population, okay? The unnatural confinement, um, it's just common sense. It's gonna breed disease, okay? They often have contact with feces and with their fellow animals who have died, right? So diseases are rampant. Um, antibiotics um, are given to these animals routinely. So when they're healthy, because one, they actually do two things and one is counterintuitive. They, antibiotics help these animals gain weight. Um, and so that's helpful for the industry. But then of course they prevent disease that would, you know, if, if it weren't for these antibiotics, the industry couldn't survive because the, the animals couldn't survive very long. Okay, so we'll talk more about antibiotic resistance. Um, then there's direct foodborne illness. So that was, you know, viruses can come in contact with the farm staff running off in the water, but this is direct uh, animal protein to consumer foodborne illness. So um, there's a study about nine years ago that showed 48% of chicken in grocery stores, when you test it, it's got fecal matter um, in those cases. The USDA has a no feces policy, but it only applies to feces that's visible. So anything microscopic, uh, which still has those pathogens, doesn't apply. Um, what happens is, particularly with those chickens, which in the industry they call them broilers, they are slaughtered and often the intestine is still intact so that it's, you know, they're, they're, they're slaughtered, the intestines still there. They're then put in these huge cooling vats of water and you know if any one of those thousands of birds has um, some bacteria still hanging out in their small or large intestine it's going to spread to all the meat okay um there are 48 million foodborne infections just in the u.s every year the majority are beef now granted a lot are from romaine lettuce um, but when you look at it uh, the cdc looked at how is romaine getting so in being such a, a source of um, foodborne illness. And it's, they, they've tracked it down and saw that, well, it's the feces um, from the irrigated water um, coming from beef. So it's cattle every step of the way. Just a quick anecdote about this. I, you know, I went to a bar mitzvah when I was 13. Um, it was one of those parties where you sign up for the chicken, the fish, or whatever. I ate chicken at the time. and. Um, the day after the bar mitzvah, uh, I was on the toilet for, I don't know, at least 36 hours. I uh, ran into the, 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 my friend's mother uh, a month later. She said, without saying hello, she said, you know, it wasn't the chicken. I said, oh, okay, uh, take your word for it. Um, how are these zoonotic diseases transferred by wildlife? Well, Habitat destruction is occurring across the world. You all know this too well. Um, so the animals who've lost their home migrate out and they might encroach on um, more on places that are more populated by humans. So our contact and our interface with other species increases by these kind of means. It's thought that when um, the, the peak zoonotic transfer is when 40% of an ecosystem has been destroyed. Okay, we'll talk more about deforestation. All right, why are we on Zoom? Why did we wear a mask to the grocery store today? Um, why are kids, if you have kids, um, learning on their computer? What's going on? Well, this is the most important and why I'm really um, happy to be here with you sharing this. Uh, if you don't already know, this virus, it's not definitive, but there's a massive scientific consensus um, in the, you know, in the variety of climate change exists consensus that COVID-19 came from um, horseshoe bats in rural China that then 
infected an intermediate mammalian host, probably pangolins, which then infected humans at the Hubei seafood market. Okay, so this is the infamous wet market where there are live and, and dead animals for sale. And they're in these stacked cages. They're often coming through the wildlife trade from various continents. So they had no interface in the past. Now all of a sudden they're living together very intimately on horrible conditions, right? So they, you know, in a few days they'll be cut up um, for sale. Um, the pangolins, if you're not familiar, are the most heavily trafficked mammals on earth. Okay, they have those scales that have purported benefits in traditional Chinese medicine um, for fertility, renal health. Um, what happened was in the 70s or 80s, there was rampant poverty in China and it's improved, it's still a problem. But what happened was people were trying to make ends meet by any means necessary, of course, which is understandable. And wildlife started to be hunted more. Um, at first, you know, the government pushed back, but then it said, okay, do your thing. And then over the next decade or so, the wildlife trade became very powerful as represented by big lobbyists. Um, and when, when the government tries to restrict their practices, they don't have much luck, okay? So it's like these wet markets and some of the practices that you see there would have been suppressed, but the, the industry is strong. and we know how that works here in the States. Um, okay, let's talk about the genetics for a moment. So I know some of you have a medical background, scientific background, not everybody. This one is, this um, mechanism is pretty simple. You see the green and the blue and they mix um, to become green and blue. So viruses are obligate parasites. They need a host cell and they infect that host cell, but if they're two different varieties or strains in the same cell, um, the recombination can occur in there. And then when they reproduce, um, you get a mix genetically of the two original viruses. So this is what happens to simplify things uh, in, when in a zoonotic transfer. Okay, so these geneticists looked at the coronavirus from regional bats and from that Wuhan wet market. Um, they found considerable overlap in those genomes, particularly at the receptor binding motif, okay, which codes for part of the spike protein. So you've seen those graphics of the coronavirus, with the spikes around the outside. Um, those are the, the kind of functional unit, those spikes are what bind to human ACE2 receptors. And they found that the pangolin uh, coronaviruses that were implicated, they can also bind to human ACE2 receptors. So it's like there are too many clues here um, and they add up to the, that transmission route that I described, okay? Well, um, some environmental respite has taken place and we all saw these amazing pictures in the news, wild animals or uh, domesticated animals that weren't being um, used, got to go on vacation. And um, our city streets weren't as busy and the animals noticed and you'd see them in places where you didn't, hadn't seen them in a while. Um, in terms of oil, Okay, I was looking into the oil markets and what happened at the beginning of the pandemic, the oil states in the Middle East were producing extra, but the supply was starting to exceed the demand. People weren't traveling as much and they were storing all this oil above ground. They didn't know what to do with it. So th they began to run out of space in the Middle East for storage. So the OPEC oil producers uh, reduced their production in April by 9.7 million barrels of oil per day. Um, that lasted until July and then they produced a little more, but it was still a reduction. Uh, US and Canada jointly reduced our, our production of oil by 3.3 million barrels per day. So, you know, there's some interesting environmental consequences here. Not everything was bad. Here's New Delhi, India. Um, the first picture is from April. 
2019 before the pandemic and the other pictures from 2020. And so some interesting environmental fallout. Okay. How, how what happened in the meat markets um, in terms of the economic market here? So, well, what happened was people were getting sick, the staff at these factory farms, right? In the slaughterhouses, they were having, getting infected with COVID-19 and um, some of the slaughterhouses and production facilities had to shut down. So what happened then and, and, you know, the animals being produced for slaughter started to build up. Again, the supply exceeded the demand in a sense. And the problem is that at these slaughter facilities, their equipment only serves a particular size of animal. It's, everything is very well calibrated. Um, and the animals were growing with no place for slaughter and getting too large. It's just an unbelievable problem to have. And um, so millions of animals, uh, particularly pigs and chickens, were killed, uh, would never be food, but were killed just because the system wasn't built for them anymore. They're getting too big. Okay, so pig processing was only at 60% of total capacity at one point. So a massive disruption in the supply chain. Um, the USDA gave poultry plants a waiver. They said, normally we require you to do 140 birds per minute uh, in terms of you know, the assembly line slaughtering 140 birds per minute, um, but we'll give you a break. You can do 175 birds per minute because we have an emergency here. Um, you know, they were, then there, there's some pseudo ethics about how the animals should be called, C-U-L-L-E-D, called to depopulated. Lots of euphemisms there that they use in the industry. And so um, they would often do it through the penetrating and non-penetrating those bolt guns, um, electrocution, um, and then these gases. So sometimes it's carbon dioxide, other times it's nitrogen foam, which you see here in the picture. So the animals are sprayed with this foam, they die from anoxia. Um, then, the, you know, there are environmental waste issues here because suddenly you have millions of animals all dying at once um, and not going to the supermarket. So where do you put these and how, you know how much methane is produced um, in those disposal sites and just a massive disaster the, um, the meat industry lost about 20 billion dollars through this um, dean foods and borden dairy are two of the largest dairy uh, dairy producers in the united states they've filed for bankruptcy this year I won't say anything snarky about that. Um, these are the minks in Denmark. I don't know if you saw this. Uh, now, this picture, this is just a normal year. Minks, you know, some of them have been deferred already, some haven't. This is all for fur, for fur coats. Um, there's a mutation in the SARS-CoV-2 virus that was identified in these minks, okay? Um, the government in Denmark ordered for the culling of 2.85 million minks which was done. Um, okay, but some silver lining here. Um, as of March, 2020, the plant food industry had grown uh, about 30% in two years. But in the nine weeks leading up to May, which is just an interval that you, know, you might remember, it was, there was a lot of turmoil then and the markets were fluctuating and, um, Plant-based meat sales increased by 264% um, in that time. Plant-based milks continue to grow exponentially and dairies are declining alongside. Um, every meat producer now has big investments in plant-based products. They all have their own product line or they're partnering with other companies. You know, Beyond Meat has a deal with McDonald's and doing the McPlant burger. Um, they have the Impossible Whopper at Burger King. So 
things are changing. And just as a disclaimer, um, you know, I don't support regular consumption of this stuff. Uh, it's not whole food plant-based, which we'll, we'll talk about, but it, they are truly just from purely from the nutritional standpoint, they are healthier than their meat counterparts um, because of what you're not taking in. And um, they're great transition foods for people who, you know, want that, you got to satisfy the craving from what they've been eating most of their lives as they transition. And I've been there. So, um, okay, what are the climate costs? What are CAFOs? Well, con confined animal feeding operations. So it's, it's the industry term for factory farms. Okay. Let me just take a breather. Can, I can't see the Zoom, but can everyone hear me and everyone's doing okay? Yes. Okay, good. So um, the conservative estimate by the UN's Food and Agricultural Organization, the FAO, is that livestock accounts for 18% of greenhouse gas emissions. Okay, that's plenty. That's a lot. But uh, many people have called attention to how that FAO report might have overlooked some emissions. So first of all, and, and I kind of, I'll summarize their argument here. Cattle respiration is not accounted for by the FAO. So, you know, just like us, we breathe out CO2. Well, that's not accounted for in the FAO report. They counted the methane from the cow farts, um, but not the CO2. And then another one is the forgone carbon sink of four. So meaning we're not counting what we might have um, sequestered in CO2 if we weren't doing all this deforestation. Um, thirdly, the, when you measure the potency of methane and the, the warming potential, um, it's, a, it's a tricky mathematic operation. Um, you know, it, it, so the authors here who were criticizing the FAO report say that they used an unrealistic time frame of how long methane was going to hang out in the atmosphere and contribute to warming. Another issue is that FAO didn't include farmed fish. Um, additionally, uh, the livestock sector has just increased since that report. And then there's energy required to freeze and refrigerate animal products that out, that's, you know, way exceeds that um, energy that would be needed for plant foods. And then there's several other issues. So um, these guys um, claim that 51% of all greenhouse gas emissions come from the livestock sector when we take everything into account. Now, I don't have the sort of economic mathematical background to really make, you know, say that they're absolutely right. It's 51%. But I think what's clear is that these are all estimates. And if we're not taking everything into account, then um, the livestock sector contribution could be much greater than 18%. Okay. So, um, this diagram is a little weird, but you can see, I want you to hone in on poultry there. Okay. And look all the way on the right and it says three 13% conversion efficiency. So of all the energy, um, in terms of calories, the food energy that a chicken eats, you lose 87% and you're left with 13% as eaten by humans. Um, that's pretty wasteful. And I've heard the analogy when you eat chicken, it's like taking 10 plates of food out of the fridge for dinner, putting eight, so we'll round down to 80%. You put eight directly in the trash and then maybe eat the last two. Um, that's the efficiency we're talking about with poultry. Now for other animals, it's even worse. You can see the beef has a 3% conversion rate. Okay. Okay, the, this is important for us to know. The absolute primary impetus for deforestation is livestock. So it's to graze cattle and it's to grow the soy and corn to feed the cattle. Was, corn and soy are not going to humans. They're going to the, to the cows who will then, you know, the 90 
seven percent um, conversion loss later, and we could might benefit from the three percent energy, right? If we incorporate the previous slide, okay. So two thirds of Amazon deforestation is for cattle and soy. Um, the let's see. Um, this, the, the one problem among many is that there's a biodiversity loss that comes from this kind of deforestation. So you guys have heard about the sixth extinction. I mean, it's really severe. Um, the extinction rate right now is between 1,000 and 10,000 times higher than the natural extinction rate. So this is not um, a natural process here. We're accelerating um, biodiversity loss. Okay, lots of stats, but I, I do want to give you a sense of what's going on. So 96% of mammalian biomass on the planet is three mammals, humans, pigs, and cows. Okay, only 4% of mammals on the planet are wild. Um, 200 million um, land animals are killed every day. The, the stat from before was billions over the year. Every day, 200 million land animals are killed. Um, to, to get a pound of beef requires 1,800 gallons of water. Okay, that's what the average human drinks over seven years. Okay, um, other environmental issues include air pollution, uh, water pollution, algae blooms, okay? Um, Dr. Clapper, who I mentioned, uses the analogy that our planet is sick and um, our polluted waterways are like, you know, cardiovascular disease or arteries are malfunctioning. The air pollution is like respiratory disease. Global warming is like a fever. And with COVID-19 now, it's like we have this acute infection on top of the chronic diseases. Um, the, the, the earth is, is sick and that's why you all um, do this amazing work at Sierra Club. And um, so, you know, and one other environmental harm is antibiotic resistance. So a lot of you know exactly how this works. I'll be brief, but when you're overusing antibiotics, they kill bacteria, right? But inevitably some bacteria will survive because they just have that adaptation. They're naturally resistant to that antibiotic. But if you're using antibiotics all the time, then you get those resistant bacteria, they'll survive and proliferate. Um, they reproduce a little bit faster than we do. And then all of a sudden you have colonies and huge populations of antibiotic resistant bacteria and they run off in the water. They go right to the staff of these facilities. Okay, we consume them directly in the meat, dairy, and eggs. Um, we talked about how 80% of antibiotics in this country go to animals who aren't sick, but um, they need that to survive in their conditions. Okay. When an animal is slaughtered, just like with the chicken we saw in, in the supermarket, um, those gut microbes spill out onto every surface in the, in the slaughter facility and workers take them home, you know, we eat them. Um, there are 2 million antibiotic resistant infections each year with 23,000 consequent deaths. Um, this, before COVID-19, there's more attention on this. The CDC and, and WHO are calling this um, the biggest public health crisis, crisis of our time. Um, it hasn't gone away, okay? So we have to think about that, all right? You've all seen these charts of foods, you know, and their relative greenhouse gas contributions. Cheese is third, and, the, and all the diagrams like this, cheese is way up there after beef. Why is that? Um, well, because it takes 10 parts milk to make one part cheese. And it's just very energy intensive. It's the same with ice cream. Um, Dr. Neil Barnard has a good analogy for cheese. Um, he, you know, we, everyone says, I love cheese. Uh, I just love it. Well, it doesn't love you back. Right? It, it's harmful for your arteries. Um, it's not very environmentally friendly. And, but it, you know, we can't give it up. And so it's sort of like an abusive relationship. 
Um, so we need to get out of that. Um, of course, I was a massive pizza consumer for most of my life. So um, everyone is at a different stage. Okay. Um, we have some labor issues uh, that are, we, we can't overlook this stuff. It's really brutal. So most of the factory farm workers today in the US are from Latin America, okay? And um, this picture is from 2019. This is a poultry plant where 700 Hispanic immigrants were arrested this is in Mississippi. Um, this happens all the time. They're arrested and deported um, systematically from these places where they're doing the hard work to produce our food. So they're physically dangerous jobs. Um, you know, the, um, there are all these deportations and of course they're not, they don't have the immigration status to receive things like COVID relief funding. It's just, um, it's, you know, we have to think about the labor issues alongside the environmental issues. Okay, then we have environmental justice. Well, this chart is about people in the vicinity of a hog facility in North Carolina. So the dark red are people within 1.2 miles of the facility. Okay, orange and yellow progressively further out from that radius. Well, um, they found, and this is Duke University just a few years ago, they found that the people um, closest to that facility had more anemia, kidney disease, and bacterial blood infection or sepsis, okay? Because the North Carolina factory farms produce 10 billion gallons of fecal waste every year. What happens is it festers in these lakes and it releases bacteria, hydrogen sulfide, ammonia. Um, it's then sprayed on surrounding fields as fertilizer and who lives closest to these facilities? Well, it's African-Americans and Hispanics. So there are racial issues here that cannot be overlooked. Or mental health issues, you know, and this, you know, it gets worse. This is not a really representative picture. Um, they're brutal practices that these workers have to do every day. And they're, it's assembly line style and they do the exact same role. So it's, this repetitive violence um, wears people down. And this has been well documented. There are higher rates of major depressive disorder, uh, PTSD, suicide, and then crime in the community um, when they control for other factors like socioeconomics. And, um, you know, why is that? Well, this wears on you if you have to spend every day. Um, dismembering animals. So let's see. Well, let me get too carried away here. All right. So now this is like a transition in our in our presentation here. Where we're going to talk about human immunity and and um, um, and gut flora. And so so it, we'll take a break from factory farms, but look at plant based nutrition and all of its benefits. Okay. Also in the context of COVID nineteen. Okay, so what are some basic principles of the immune system? Well, in the photo, we have different lymphoid tissues. So it's really amazing. You know, we, these, these organs aren't discussed so often um, in public. No one cares about the pears, patches, or the tonsils, but they're amazing. We wouldn't survive a minute without them. What they're doing is, um, they're, they're cultivating our immune cells. They're places where immune cells mature and learn to recognize self versus other so that our immune, so our immune system doesn't attack itself and cause autoimmune disease and instead um, targets true foreign pathogens to protect us every day. It's just, it is the most intricate system imaginable. Um, it, you know, it, it's, it makes our, you know, any sort of military system or most advanced cities in the world, it makes them look silly um, how intricate this stuff is. So I'm just always inspired by the immune system. 
Um, B cells are you know, a major category of immune cells. They make antibodies. T cells have a few different roles. Um, the T regulatory cells function in tolerance. So that's like recognizing self versus other. Um, the CD4 positive T cells, and if this means nothing to the terms, just don't worry about it. But another type of T cells, um, they're the helper cells. They put out these cytokines and recruit other cells when we need to ramp up the immune response. CD8 T cells are cytotoxic, so they directly kill foreign pathogens um, and also identify and um, kill cancer cells. Very important. So the immune system is constantly surveying the body to see if there's any cancerous growth. That's why we see, you know, to the extent we can influence our immunity through lifestyle and diet, um, we can prevent cancer to a significant degree. Um, okay. Lots of noise on this slide, but I want to show you how the standard American diet, or SAD, um, promotes inflammation and immune dysregulation. Okay, so these gray cells, on the, the image on the left with the gray cells on top, those are respiratory epithelial cells. So lining our whole respiratory system, we breathe in, um, the air might not be clean, it might have viruses in it, and we need a mechanism to make sure we're not getting infected. So macrophages are a type of cell that collect bad stuff, sequester it, um, sometimes build up walls of granulomas around um, that material to make sure it's not um, creating a systemic infection. Um, so let's see what I wanted to say about this one. When, so you can see in the second and third um, images there with the respiratory cells, this is when an immune response is mounted and they're gonna recruit the monocytes and the neutrophils, I can deploy the troops to take care of that pathogen. Okay, when the immune system is not perfectly calibrated, when it's, there's dysregulation, um, that defense can get out of hand. And if you've heard the term cytokine storm, um, that's what we're talking about. Immune cells go nuts and put out too many cytokines. Um, it's, it's, it's not actually a helpful response, it's detrimental. And earlier in the pandemic, the medical community believed that cytokine storms were the main mechanism of death, the molecular level, that that was what's happening. Now there's a little more controversy about the nitty gritty of that, but immune dysregulation remains a critical factor when we're um, thinking about COVID-19 outcomes. Okay, um, this image on the right, uh, you can see how our food, so in order to digest food, we need microbes in the gut. That's what they're there for. And it, it, the microbes um, depend on what we eat because they're gonna be the ones eating it. So you have microbes that eat lettuce, microbes that eat apples, microbes that eat meat. You know, so it, um, you end up with a totally different community down there. And it's just amazing. There are um, so many more bacterial cells in the body than human cells. There are 150 to 200 times more bacterial cells in our body than human cells. So by cell count, we're less than 1% human, which has just like bewildering implications philosophically. When we, who are we when we say, you know, when we think about the self, um, do we have to include our friends um, without whom we wouldn't survive a day? So um, this, you know, we're inoculated when we're born, we come out the vaginal canal, out of the C-section, all this, bacteria um, start to um, colonize from our mouth to our anus, our vaginal tract, our skin, everywhere. Um, again, biodiversity becomes paramount here. Um, biodiversity has been consistently associated with disease prevention. So the more different types of microbes you have, um, the better you do. And how do we achieve 
biodiversity? Well, it's through a varied plant-based diet. Every different plant and vegetable has different um, bacteria that come and ferment it. And um, the fibers are what these bacteria eat and want and thrive on. So um, plant foods happen to spawn these bacteria that make short chain fatty acids. Okay, these are, um, they have names like butyrate, um, propionate. Okay, what they do is they turn down systemic inflammation in the body and they increase T regulatory cells. We talked about those T cells that help you decipher if it's a self component or if it's a foreign antigen. So for immune regulation, um, this is when we start to see the connection between the gut flora and um, immune um, health. Okay, so whether we're at the level of the single organism or the level of an ecosystem, uh, biodiversity uh, lends itself to health. And these themes are, it's not a coincidence, right? We, we see themes that play out on different scales, whether it's the organism or the ecosystem or the planet, okay? We don't wanna be clear cutting our inner rainforest, um, just the same as we don't wanna be doing that with the Amazon. Okay, um, how to, and remember SAD means standard American diet. How does this block microbial diversity and foster disadvantageous species? Well, for one example, we can talk about trimethylamine oxide, TMAO. So for those who are unfamiliar, okay, TMAO is considered the molecule from hell. What it does is puts, it, it, it deposits cholesterol in our arteries, sort of the opposite of what we want to do in, in the setting of so much cardiovascular disease and diabetes. But how is it created? Well, the carnitine from meats and the choline from eggs, they go down to the small intestine, large intestine, and they have to be fermented somehow. And the bacteria um, that are spawned to facilitate that, their byproduct um, of metabolism is trimethylamine. It goes to the liver, it's oxidized to trimethylamine oxide. Okay, this molecule is implicated in diabetes, cardiovascular disease, atherosclerosis, metabolic syndrome, which is the sort of combination state of high blood pressure and diabetes and obesity. You know, these are the real plagues of our society. They're happening before COVID-19 and it's not to um, belittle the situation by any means, but we, we got to look at the bigger context and we'll do that in the next slide here. So, um, you know, what we've seen is that Chronic disease is a major risk factor for everything around COVID-19, hospitalizations, deaths. So unfortunately, 70% of America has at least one chronic disease. 73% um, of Americans are either overweight or obese. The projection is that by 2030, nine years, um, every other American will be obese. Obese, not just overweight. So th this is scary, and um, I'm so glad you're here so we can figure out what to do about it. Um, there have been lots of reports on BMI by diet type. So the Adventist Health Study looked at 60,000 people, and they found that the, your BMI is proportional to the amount of animal foods in the diet. Okay? Um, and you might say, well, of course, the vegetarians are more likely to be have certain you know income status and education well no they controlled for all that they adjusted for income education all these factors and they they still found the following so vegans had a bmi of 23.6 by the way the, the healthy range is 18.5 to 25 after that you're considered overweight now there are there's some factors people are have different proportions and it's not a perfect metric, but by and large, um, we're, we want to be between 18.5 and 25. Okay, vegans were 23.6, vegetarians were 25.7, pescatarians were 26.3, flexitarians, 
27.3. Omnivores, 28.8. These are average BMIs. You know, and, and those BMI values mapped predictably onto the risk for type 2 diabetes. Um, so we need to pick up these clues here. And one, one thing I wanted to say about this is they recently did a study out of Stanford about Beyond, um, Beyond Burgers, okay? And granted, it was funded by Beyond Meat, so we need to raise an eyebrow. But they had no role in the design of the study and in, in the analysis of the study. So there's probably something to it. What they found is that um, they did a crossover study where for eight weeks, um, group one ate Beyond Burgers, two servings a day. Uh, group two ate, ate regular cow burgers. And then they swapped after eight weeks and group one did the opposite, group two did the opposite. They found that the group that started with meat and then switched to beyond, they saw their um, TMAO, which we talked about, they saw that drop. Um, fascinating because the, the bacteria changed um, and didn't need to be, so their byproduct wasn't TMAO anymore, it was something else. Right. Um, both groups had a 10 point reduction in their LDL, the so called bad cholesterol, um, during the eight weeks where they're eating Beyond Burgers. Um, okay, let's get to the fun, colorful part. And we're almost through, but um, it's, you know, and this is not a comprehensive plant based nutrition lecture. But I'd be happy to do another another time, but. It's just amazing. Every single major chronic illness, um, including cancer and dementia, you see significant um, declines in risk uh, on a plant-based diet. Some of this is due to healthy circulation in arteries that are free to transport that oxygen and the red blood cells deliver oxygen to all of our tissues. Some of it's due to just weight loss alone um, as we saw with the BMI data. Some of it's due to the healthy gut flora that we talked about. And some is from reduced systemic inflammation. Um, what happens is you get, when you have um, all those bacteria breaking down meats, steroids, and eggs, um, you do this for decades and you're having you know, multiple meat-based meals a day. Uh, your, those bacteria start um, digging holes right in the epithelial cells of your gut so that you have a more permeable, permeable gut. Right? And then pathogens that are supposed to just kind of go from mouth to anus, anus and, and be eliminated, they're starting to get uh, into that bloodstream, into the enteric circulation through the gut instead of being just going down the tube and being eliminated. So when we talk about systemic inflammation, that is often the mechanism. And it just increases your risk of everything you don't want, that kind of inflammation. There's more and more research about its role in Alzheimer's, other forms of dementia. We know that um, vascular dementia, which is like basically having a stroke or a mini stroke and suffering long-term co cognitive um, issues, it's, it's the same mechanism as a heart attack. So it's, it's really the food um, is the primary driver of, of these devastating diseases. Okay, um, well, how does this work? What is it actually doing in our immune system? Um, these colorful foods, well, colors indicate antioxidants. Um, they're advantageous to the plants. They evolved to have these components. And when we eat them, we benefit the same way. So we're always producing reactive oxygen species and free radicals. So this is biochem biochemistry where you have these hyperactive, they're free radicals, it's kind of a funny term. They're, they're these hyperactive molecules that want desperately to either add more electrons or remove their electron because they're in this unstable state, okay? Um, they, they wreak havoc because they generate all sorts of biochemical reactions that you don't want. They're very unstable. 
what antioxidants do in part is neutralize those, those free radicals. And um, the reactive oxygen species, they just simmer everything down. So plant-based foods have polyphenols, flavonoids, there's teeming with antioxidants. Um, and they also have antimicrobial properties intrinsic to them. So when we're talking about um, a healthy immune system, some of these nutrients will just will do the work, you know, alongside your immune cells. Um, phenolic acids, what they do is they form complexes with um, the, some structural proteins on the microbe um, and deactivate them. It's just incredible. So um, a few examples of, and when we talk about vitamins, right, these are antioxidants. So vitamin A um, is found in carrots, sweet potato, squash, orange stuff. Vitamin D, you get it from sunshine. Um, you get it from fortified plant foods, like cereals and plant-based milks. For some people, it would be advantageous to supplement, not everyone. Um, vitamin C, uh, citrus, right? Peppers, strawberries. Vitamin E, um, it's prevalent in broccoli, spinach, nuts and seeds. And then we've heard a lot about zinc. Zinc um, is part of our immune function and, and facilitates lots of biochemistry in there. Um, zinc is found in nuts, seeds, beans, lentils, selenium, another mineral um, that's required. And the biggest source is Brazil nuts. Um, and, but it's also in things like rice and oats. So the acronym G-BOMBS is helpful for those anti-cancer foods. Remember the antioxidants and um, a healthy immune system are essential for preventing cancer. Um, and not 100% of the time, but just dramatically reducing your risk of, I mean, it's, this has been shown in many different cancers, particularly breast, prostate, colon. And it's likely that it applies to more cancers than that. And we'll discover these things pretty soon. But GBOM stands for greens, beans, onions, mushrooms, berries, seeds. Okay. Um, and this is my penultimate slide here. This is um, Dr. Campbell. He wrote the China study. This is a transformational book about um, plant-based population level disease prevention. Um, I just wanted to mention this. He's been speaking about how years ago um, he found that a plant-based diet can literally deactivate viruses um, because although we know they're beneficial for the immune system in general, we there, there's little evidence that they you know, we just don't have the data to show that they actually deactivate viruses and bacteria in that direct sort of way, but he's, he's done it. And it was in the context of um, hepatitis B virus in China. So I want to tell you a little bit about his experiment. First, he found that hep B induced liver cancer, because that's what hep B can do, unfortunately, is promote liver cancer. So in mice, that liver cancer grew with animal protein and it was suppressed um, through a plant-based diet. Okay, then he looked at humans and tested the effect of food on hep B, okay? Plant-based diet was associated with more hep B antibodies and fewer hep B antigen. So that's like what a vaccine will do. Um, that's, you know, we're talking about remission from a virus or a cure of a virus. Um, he found that the more thymine, plant protein, dietary fiber, polyunsaturated fats, and antioxidants people had in their blood, the more hep B antibodies they had to protect them from that virus. You know, granted, SARS-CoV-2 and, and hep B are different viruses. They play by different rules, but it's exceedingly likely that our immune system employs some similar tactics in deactivating them. Okay. Um, finally, um, oh, I do. I, okay, two more quick ones. 
sometimes people worry that they'll develop a deficiency on a plant-based diet. Well, most of you know this iron um, is um, found in beans and legumes. Um, calcium is in leafy greens. B12 is in fortified plant-based foods like the milks and the cereals and the breads. Um, B12, you know, if you're a strict vegan, it's recommended to supplement B12. But and these are just some examples. It should not be an impediment to transitioning is a nutrient scarcity. Um, we're in a, a state of nutritional extravagance. We have too much of everything and not enough, um, you know, fiber and um, antioxidants and water and polyphenols and these protective foods that we need now more than ever. Where do you get your protein? Well, here's some examples. I just want everyone to know um, the average American eats two times more protein than is recommended, okay? And if you ask a doctor, you know, if you ever seen someone with a protein deficiency, she'll say, no, never, not even close. You know, once in a while, a nephrologist, a kidney doctor, has seen someone with a particular syndrome, nephrotic syndrome, where they're peeing out protein. Um, that's you know a specific case, and often that syndrome develops through hyperfiltration of the kidney from that standard American diet. Okay, so um, for someone who's 150 pounds, uh, it's recommended to get 50 five grams of protein per day. This is like big consensus. Um, it comes from the conversion of 0 0.8 grams of protein per kilogram body weight. So if you're 150 pounds, 55 grams of protein, um, we just, it's too easy. It's too easy to achieve that. Okay, uh, that's all I got. Couple reference slides. And I wanna really thank all of you for being here. Um, I'll linger on this slide while we do some questions if you have any, um, so you can take down my info. I wanted to offer to all of you, um, my school year has, it's, it's winding down and I start residency in June, but between now and then, if you are looking to transition um, in any way to a plant-based diet, uh, I can, I am hereby, um, offering to be your personal coach. You can email or call me anytime. Um, we can set up regular appointments. I want to help in any way I can. Um, so I'll leave this up um, and I'll hand it to Sarah for whatever comes next. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, just um, Zach, I just wanted to say a few people have had to leave uh, but they all left you positive messages in the chat. This was very okay. informative, very good. Uh, there is a meeting starting at 6.30, very important one. And we will have to be off, let's say by 6.25. So uh, if people have any questions for Zach, uh, please feel free to ask them. Uh, you can go off mute now. And Zach, I think you can stop screen sharing too now so we can all see everybody. How's that? But Zach, thank you, you really oh, covered yeah. So much material. I learned a lot. I, I'll admit, I thought I knew a lot, but I learned a lot from you. And uh, this was great that you drew the connections of how, um, what, uh, environmental contamination, uh, you know, climate change, habitat loss, and human health, too. Uh, interesting how we need a biodiversity of bacteria in our gut, too. I never stopped to think of it that way, but that. You explained this all very well, thank you. And now, um, okay. okay, everyone can go off mute. If you have any questions for Zach, you know, please, if, if you don't mind Zach answering a few questions. Oh, of course, yep. Okay. I'll be here until, until you have to move on to the next meeting, I'm, I'm available. Okay, so we have about another 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, does anyone have questions for Zach? Hi, Zach. I'm Christine. Um, I am actually in Maine, uh, on the mid coast right now. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. That was um, super compelling. Uh, I have been trying 
um, for the past uh, six months, maybe, to head down the road of a plant-based fire, uh, plant-based diet. Excellent. And um, my question is, uh, you had made a comment about, you know, um, some of the, I guess I don't know how to refer to them other than more processed foods like um, beyond meat or, you know, the, the, the uh, cheese um, like products uh, and those types of things. Um, sometimes I've had a serious craving for some of those things. And so I've, I've done the, the um, plant-based alternative. Um, but I'm just curious, is there enough information or studies out there that speak to um, whether these alternatives are um, healthy? You know, I see a, a lot of soy options, a lot of palm oil, a lot of coconut, um, but I'm assuming they're all significantly processed to turn them into a slice of cheese or, you know, other types of things. And so I'm just curious if I'm, you know, uh, you had mentioned nothing is as good as just eating the, the real thing. And so I was just curious about the, um, the health implications of some of these uh, alternative options. Thanks. Of course. Well, thanks, Christine. Um, I hope it's not too cold in Maine. But <laughs> not too bad. <laughs> Good. Um, well, sure. This is really important because these foods are prevalent now and we need to be able to communicate, well, just to know for ourselves and communicate to other people who it's easy to say, well, th these are ultra processed foods all these vegans and plant eaters aren't really benefiting themselves. And it's true, optimally, the literature is just pretty clear. A whole food plant-based diet um, is, will give us the, the greatest benefits in health promotion, disease prevention. Okay, so whole foods eliminate things like oil, um, just process it, they're whole. So instead of olive oil, it's the olive itself. Um, instead of ketchup, it's the tomato. <laughs> And um, that's what we want to aim for. But I'm fully in support of occasional um, plant-based, you know, the, sub, the, the substitutes, um, or more than occasional for people who are, tra who are transitioning out of a, a meat and dairy-based diet. And if more people ate, and purely from the nutritional standpoint here, because um, I do believe that they're healthier, that, beyond or the impossible burger is healthier than the beef counterpart. There are a few reasons. One, we dug into with the TMAO. So you're developing different gut microbes um, who will produce different byproducts. And if you have less TMAO, I mean, that's a serious benefit. Um, and there are other things like the hormones and antibiotics. You just don't get those in a Beyond Burger. Um, you could buy antibiotic free meat, but um, you know, the, you can't get rid of the hormones, even if there aren't added hormones, um, they're intrinsic to those meat and dairy foods. Um, you know, a, a, the, the cow is, um, has been pregnant and is lactating and there are lots of estrogens in there. They go to the liver and tell the liver to put out what's called insulin like growth factor, IGF-1 and um, promotes inflammation, all these things that contribute to disease. Uh, and the list goes on, but so um, another exciting piece is that these plant alternatives, um, they're not as, a, they're, they have the potential for every iteration um, when the companies put out a new product every iteration can be healthier than the last, but figure out how to maintain the taste while improving the nutrition profile, decreasing the sodium and the oils and the saturated fat. But the beef product is just a constant. You can't uh, improve its nutritional profile to a significant degree. So it's like um, already the plant alternatives um, are superior in terms of health, and they also have the, the prospect of, of getting healthier. Um, still don't recommend eating tons of them um, if possible. Okay, um, sorry, Zach, 
Okay, just a moment. Uh, who was that? Um, Jack, uh, Christine, who asked that question. I would just like to address one thing about that. I've been vegan for 25 years, and I found out in transitioning, the best thing for me was to um, move to whole grains, like uh, eating brown rice instead of white, whole wheat instead of white wheat or pasta. Also, some people may be wheat sensitive like I am, not an allergy, but uh, I've found that spelt, S-P-E-L-T, kamut, K-A-M-U-T, I can write these down in the chat if you'd like, einkorn and farro, F-A-R-R-O, which by the way, you can use as a substitute for rice, you can actually cook the grain, that um, these are also good substitutes for wheat. You can buy pasta made out of these grains or uh, flour, so you can make the, um, bake stuff at home with them. Um, so, you know, there are alternatives, um, you know, you can do that and you can also make some of your own cheese substitutes at home. There are recipes online. You can make cheese substitutes out of things like oats, tofu, um, oh, a lot, a lot of different yeast. Yeah, nutritional yeast, um, miso, um, potato and carrot, uh, sweet potatoes. So there are a lot of things you can do yourself at home that are a lot healthier than the pack. <clears throat> Uh, what do you say to that, Zach, as a medical student, to what I've said? In terms of doing things, that, yeah, um, it's it's always healthier to cook at home, and there are beautiful um, plant-based cheese recipes. I made a lasagna. I'm not really a cook, but I mustered the courage to make a lasagna, and I used a tofu ricotta and a tapioca-based mozzarella, um, and those are going to be healthier cheese substitutes than the dia and the other things in the store. But, okay. you know, it's, it's and from the environmental and um, animal welfare perspective, uh, it's no, it's, it's no competition. So you know, I, I have deep sympathy for these, um, the plant-based substitutes that are coming up. Okay. Jackie, it looks like Jackie had a question. And is yeah, on the um, phone. Okay, Jackie. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, good. Um, I've also been a vegan for 25 years, um, but um, um, I, I recently started working with functional medicine, had a lot of testing done. Um, you know, some things that are not typical Western medicine testing and um, <clears throat> nutrition, nutrient, nu nutrient wise, um, everything is great. The only thing that I, I need to have to add into my vegan diet is to get more omega-3 fatty acids. And um, I'm wondering if you guys have any uh, tips for that. Um, in order to boost that. I'm already doing flaxseed, you know, if I can daily, um, but you have to eat a lot of it, I think, to kind of boost it. And I'm, I'm supplementing, but do you guys have to do that? Sure. So this is an interesting area. Omega-3 fatty acids are important. Um, it's whether or not supplementation is necessary is controversial. Okay. So if, you, if you're not supplementing, then you know the omega-3 rich foods, you've got the walnuts and almonds and flax seeds, hemp seeds, avocado. Um, and a lot of people do just fine with the omega-3s in that, in that context. Um, as we get older, it's harder to, you know, the omega-3 requirement increases. It might be harder to convert the ALA, which that's the acronym for the molecule, the ALA from those omega-3 foods into the DHA and EPA, which are the, the functional ones in the human body. And so that conversion becomes a little difficult. The conversion is also um, impaired by assaults, like you know, different things with our lifestyle, like alcohol. Um, so often you can improve, I'm not saying you drink any, but, um, <laughs> but uh, you know, some people find their conversion rate improved when they decrease alcohol consumption things like that but then if you do supplement um then they're wonderful algae algae based dha and um dpa epa and dha supplements and um they you know so if you and your doctor feel that it's time to really increase your omega-3s which are protective um then you can, you can find an algae-based formula at the health food store, even Whole Foods. Thank you. Of course. Okay. Any other questions? 
Okay, we're going to have to get off in about uh, three minutes. I just would like to say that uh, the Plant-Based Planet team has uh, three events per month now. Uh, our sustainable kitchen cooking class is mm -hmm. done by Chef Diana Goldman. She is a professional vegan chef. And Zach, you're welcome to join us too if you'd like. Uh, hey. You don't have to be in Massachusetts to join. Uh, these are, as I've said, free and open to the public. They're an hour long. And Diana shows you how to prepare a particular vegan dish in her home. So, and she answers questions for all participants. Uh, if, you're, if you come along, last month she made a red lentil dal with coconut rice, which was really good, uh, Indian style. Uh, she's also made a what? Oh, it, it escapes my mind now. And then we have our educational plant-based potluck dinner where members of the uh, plant-based planet team, uh, it's you know, actually more like a class. We show people how to make particular um, kinds of food. Each of us taking say like five to 10 minutes um, to explain how to make something. And because I can't take my computer into the kitchen, I actually will just show the food in front of the computer. So, um, you know, we do that too. Uh, you're welcome to come along with that as, to that as well. Uh, they're in the chat. And uh, we're going to sign off in about another minute or two. Um, any last questions for me or Zach before we go? No? Okay. Well, thank you all so much for coming. Uh, we really appreciate this and uh, your interest. And Zach, thank you so much for such a well-rounded talk, talking on uh, so many issues, as well as the human rights, social justice issues of the workers, which we also have to look into and take into consideration. Uh, this touches so many issues that, you know, obviously is the, at the Sierra Club, our major focus is the environment, but we are now taking environmental justice into a cons uh, consideration, making it a major component of our campaigns for all sorts of issues. And uh, I'm glad, so glad you touched on that as well, Zach. And this also is such an important issue for human health. Again, thank you all so much for coming. Big round of applause for Zach. We really appreciate all your work uh, and good luck with your medical career. Oh, there was one more question. Um, how did you match your, choose your specialty, Zach? One more quick question before we go. Sure. Well. Um, I'm in the process of this is residency application season. So I'm pursuing family medicine. Um, I want to know people over time and get to work with them on lifestyle modification and be, you know, in the community doing this kind of advocacy. So it was, a, it was an easy choice to go primary care. Um, okay. Well, great. It's, it sounds, yeah, you've done a lot of good preliminary work for that specialty. All right. Thanks again, Zach. Thank you everybody for coming and, uh, Bye. I uh, hope we'll see you again at future Plant-Based Planet events. Thanks, everyone. Bye.